happy that you could all be here for a very special evening. Uh, there are so many distinguished guests here. I'd like to at least do reference to some of them that I see here in the front room uh, as a matter of protocol. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, well, I won't mention our keynote uh, speaker yet. I'll, I'll mention him maybe last. But uh, President Karampas, former, pre former uh, president of uh, Lithuania, we're very pleased to have you here. Professor Sapovic, uh, former uh, foreign minister, minister of justice of Croatia. Mr. Uh, Selmo Sikotic, the current minister of defense, Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, Dr. Mirmir Zhujul, our very close partner and friend, uh, former foreign minister of uh, Croatia, currently president of Dubrovnik University, our partner with the academic program for the MA. We're very pleased uh, to have you with us. His Excellency Yasser Yakesh, former foreign minister of Turkey. Ambassador uh, Andras Shimioni, former Hungarian ambassador to the US. Uh, Dr. Nazar, former foreign minister of Bahrain. Erna Hanagotchukas, uh, former uh, minister of culture uh, of Luxembourg. And I'll stop there. I know that actually Professor Pushkas, former minister of European affairs. If I, if I continue now, I don't think I'll end. But I'm really very, very happy to have such a distinguished audience, uh, my fellow young leaders, uh, and also participants. Allow me to say a few words of introduction. Uh, of course, a special invitation also to the students from our MA program. Uh, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, this is the only MA program in the world in international relations and cultural diplomacy. We're delighted to have the students with us uh, for the entire four days. Uh, we've arranged also some special sessions with uh, the, the speakers together with the MA students. So in many ways, this conference is, uh, is for you. Uh, we're very happy to have you here, and uh, we're hoping to have also more interaction and questions, uh, in particular from the MA students, uh, to, to take advantage of the special opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Yves Laterme, his biography is certainly uh, too extensive to uh, summarize on one piece of paper, uh, but I will try to at least illustrate some of the highlights uh, that have made this career so exceptional uh, and also so uh, impressive. Yves Camille Desiré Laterme initially studied law at the Catholic University of Louvain and political science at the University of Ghent. He also has a master's in public administration. He worked as an auditor in Belgium's Court of Auditors before taking the position of National Secretary of the Christian People's Party, CD&D. After this, he worked as a civil servant for the European Parliament from 1992 until 1997, when he was appointed member of the Belgian Parliament, joining the House of Representatives in the same year. In 2001, he was chosen to be the fraction leader of the CD&D, and in 2003, he was elected chairman of the party. The following year, in 2004, he became Minister President of the Flemish Government in Belgium. In addition to this, Mr. Leterme has been a member of the City Council of Ypres <coughs> since 1995. In 2007, he became Vice Prime Minister of Belgium, as well as Minister of Budget, Transport, International Reform, and the North Sea. In 2009, the government in Belgium was once again reconstructed, and Yves Leterme became Minister of Foreign Affairs, before then taking the position of Prime Minister of Belgium, which he held until about two weeks ago. His current position is actually the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, so he's continuing to take his extensive experience and apply it uh, for the good of civil society and actually the international community at large. The lecture topic that he's chosen for this evening, No Diplomacy Without Culture. Please join me in a very, very warm welcome for the Honorable Mr. Yves Latere. Thank you. Remarks. First of all, um, I didn't sleep last night during the night. Uh, I was in Copenhagen yesterday evening where my football team played uh, FC Copenhagen and we won. And so I had to travel to be in time here from Copenhagen to Liège and then by car this night to Berlin to be here in time. So apologize for the fact that I'm a little bit tired. Secondly, um, I'm a Belgian and I think I'm a true Belgian in this sense that my father um, is a French-speaking Walloon citizen of Belgium. And my mother was a um, Dutch-speaking uh, woman, citizen of Belgium. So I think I'm really Belgian. Um, to uh, jump into the subject, this meant at home, where I lived, 
that we spoke French within, let's say, the uh, private atmosphere of our family. But from the moment on that uh, the door of the shop was opened, the shop held by my mother, I had to speak Dutch. This is really a Belgian story, and I'll come back on that. Thirdly, I'm not a diplomat, and uh, culture is not my strongest point of interest. So for me, it's really a challenge to talk about cultural diplomacy. And I've been thinking a lot about uh, cultural diplomacy during the last uh, weeks and months preparing my presence here in Berlin. And I found that cultural diplomacy, in fact, uh, especially during the last decade, has become a kind of uh, catch-all expression. And I think that um, to speak about it in a meaningful way, it is necessary, first, I think, to define what we mean by cultural diplomacy, and so to start what we mean by culture, and what we mean by diplomacy. Sounds logical. So first, to start with culture. As you know, culture has a lot of several meanings. In science, I'm not a scientist, at least not uh, in exact sciences. In science, it's, uh, culture is a value-free term. The culture is, uh, they say, a kind of substance in which bacilli or whatever other species are cultivated for the purpose of scientific research. But of course, this is not the, what we mean when we speak about culture in connection to diplomacy, in connection with human development and human relation. In that framework there, the term culture has a strong connotation of value, of something precious, something to be respected. And therefore, I think, before going into the subject of cultural diplomacy, we have to be quite clear about what exactly is to be respected as culture. So what do we mean by culture? First, I think, by culture, we mean change and progress. Indeed, I think that culture is the opposite of nature. Nature, which is, which is by definition, unchanging. Lions, well, no, we are in Germany, I mean, uh, rabbits. Uh, bees or fish, they uh, still live as they did millennia ago. They don't change. Human beings, on the other hand, they don't live like they did millennia ago. From the moment people have made instruments out of, uh, for instance, pieces of wood or stone or ornaments out of shells and colored stones and feathers, since then, culture has really been a breathtaking voyage of discovery to make life more agreeable to make life more comfortable, to make life more interesting and more exciting. So that's the reason why to put up what I would call a protective cover over society in the interest of, and I quote, protecting its culture is therefore, to my meaning, a contradiction, to my opinion, a contradiction in terminus. I think indeed that a culture which refuses exchange relations loses its vitality and with us. So first of all, culture means change and progress. Secondly, culture is what I would call unnatural. Indeed, culture interferes with nature to improve it, to adapt it to human needs and to human values. Culture, for instance, does not accept the law of the jungle, the law of the jungle where the stronger animals, as you know, eat the weaker ones, well, normally, and does not accept the survival of the fittest. At the contrary, the protection of the weakest, the weakest member, the weaker members of the group, a characteristic, for instance, of our well European welfare states, is literally unnatural and is part of our culture. So culture is unnatural. Thirdly, culture does not imprison, but liberates. Nature locks. Nature locks living beings up in unchangeable patterns of life, determined by race, determined by species, by gender. At the contrary, culture liberates. Culture liberates from those shackles and sets people free. Fourth, and we are uh, entering the field of diplomacy, culture is by definition exchange, is cross-pollination, is cross-fertilization. Indeed, cultures have developed in exchange and confrontation with other cultures, like the French people say, du choc des idées jaillit la lumière, from the clash of ideas, light will spring. And the same goes for the creative friction and clash of cultures. 
We grow and develop to the extent that we are open for influences from outside. And so the uh, importance of exchange of cross-pollination can be empirically diagnosed. Isolated populations, for instance, in a jungle or on an island tend to have a stagnating, often degenerating culture. Another example, during many centuries, the Chinese culture, China was way ahead of the world in its development, but it fell into stagnation and decline when it closed for political re reasons. It closed its windows and doors for the fast developing cultures elsewhere in the world. And so all this means that it is nonsense to say that learning from others is a kind of betrayal towards one's own culture. For instance, look at Europe, look at our continent. Some of the most important original discoveries by mankind, the wheel, for instance, the alphabet, were taken over from uh, Mesopotamia. And so it is a rhetoric question to ask if the Europeans have betrayed their culture by adopting them. Of course not, on the contrary. Or to give another example, vaccines, vaccines against sleeping sickness and other endemic diseases stem, of course, from a scientific culture which is at odds with the traditional African healer or witch doctor. But it's also a rhetoric question, should those vaccines be withheld from African populations because they are the product of a foreign color, culture? Of course not. Every human being is entitled to the progress of humanity. And this goes for science and technology, for art and, and literature, and also for ideas. So culture means change, means progress, means and culture is unnatural, culture liberates, culture is exchange. And it cannot be used to legitimate, to defend acts against fundamental rights and against human dignity. Indeed, the beautiful term of culture is being misused and abused when it is invoked to defend and justify backward traditions and degrading and cruel customs such as the genital mutilation of women, for instance. It is misused and abused when it is invoked to obstruct the free flow of ideas. And it is misused and abused when it is invoked to, for instance, refuse integration of migrants in the new societies where these people live in. In short, when also today, in uh, the name of, and I quote, respect of the for the local culture, violations of elementary human dignity are being justified, then the beautiful word of culture is used in a most improper way. So in that context, we are not talking about culture, but about customs and traditions. And when a so-called culture clashes with basic human dignity, then that culture is at fault and is not respectable, and we have to have the courage and conviction to say so. That's all about culture. Then we come to diplomacy. What is in fact, what is indeed diplomacy? A brief definition, a brief uh, de description of diplomacy is that it is the art of making nations work together, or at least prevent that their disagreements results in wars and other human dramas. That's a classic definition. On the other hand, you have Dean Akerson, the remarkable Secretary of State of Harry Truman. He wrote in his memoirs, and I quote, the aim of diplomacy is not so much to solve problems as to learn how to live with them unsolved. It's a nice definition too. That's not indeed a, a bad definition. But I think these days, with seven billion human beings on our planet, planet more is required. Problems like climate change, like protection of our common environment, and indeed a, a multitude of other challenges require more than the absence of armed conflict. They demand more intense worldwide cooperation. So diplomacy not in the first place in order to prevent conflicts, but in order to enhance cooperation to solve common problems. Then after speaking about culture and speaking about diplomacy, we come to cultural diplomacy. First important co consideration, the worldwide cooperation we need, the worldwide cooperation required is not a matter of personal relations, but of cooperation between states, nations, groups of people. I'm very much convinced of that. So 
let us, when we are talking about cultural diplomacy, avoid uh, some cliches. I mean that contacts between people of different nationalities and cultures, like you live today, this afternoon, this evening, these are, of course, excellent and to promote. But they are not enough to talk in terms of diplomacy. Or to give another example, if 10 friends meet each other and eat, uh, I don't know, a, a Nepalese or an, uh, or an Ethiopian dinner, it's very nice and can be very tasteful too, but it's not diplomacy. Because we should keep an, um, an essential factor in mind, namely that people react and behave differently as individuals and as members of a group. Indeed, in personal contacts, you will very often find a courteous and friendly reception in many countries. And also when nations or states are at odds with each other, their citizens will often have warm personal relations with people on the other side. Because there is a difference between the personal feelings people can have and the reflex as member of a group. To give an example from my region, I'm living in the region of Ypres, which is a small town in the Flanders part of, uh, of Belgium. We used to have a, we had the First World War, beginning of the 20th century. And it was a tradition when Christmas uh, was there, and the end of December, of course, the soldiers from the German side and the uh, Allied forces, the, the, they, uh, they got out of the trenches just to meet each other. They put the guns aside, and they had some uh, celebrations of Christmas. So they had very positive feelings, uh, the one to each other. Um, people that were on both sides of the trenches, but uh, nevertheless, the day after, they started again to shout, to, um, to, to kill, to murder, because they were members of a group that were at war. Other example, former Yugoslavia, for instance. I think in the past there have been excellent personal relations between lots of citizens of countries of the Balkan region. The proof is that lots of people from Croatia, from Serbia, from Bosnia-Herzegovina, are married with citizens, with people from other parts of Balkan. But nevertheless, we have experienced what uh, uh, terrible events uh, there were in the Balkan region in the same period. And I think it is true everywhere, even in the daily life of ordinary, um, peaceful, democratic countries. To take my country, for instance, when I go, like last week, that they are not so clean anymore, I bought these shoes, and I went in a shop, and uh, a nice-looking girl uh, tried to serve me and, and showed me some, uh, some shoes. And so for me, as a person, it was uh, the most important thing was to, to see if the shoes were nice, if they were not uh, too expensive, and they would fit me, fit me. And she was talking to me in French. And from my personal history, you know that I understand French. I speak French. But they asked her very kindly, of course, to, uh, to speak to me in Dutch. Not because I wouldn't understand her if she would selling the, be selling the shoes to me in, uh, in French, but because I'm a member of the Dutch-speaking Flemish community of my country, which is uh, the overwhelming majority of the citizens of Belgium. And that my belief is that the Belgian Federation can only, um, in a sustainable way, exist in the future when everyone respects uh, the language-related uh, rights of all the people. So I think when a foreigner would be standing beside me when I'm buying these shoes, he would, I think, not necessarily understand why I want to be served in Dutch, as he knows that I speak French. And I think he or she may think then I'm a little bit of, uh, I'm, I'm rather intolerant. But I think that if that foreigner takes the trouble to learn about the history of my country and the Flemish emancipation struggle, then he or she would understand the interests and sensitivities involved. In the same way, I think that I can only understand your personal story, but not only your personal story, but also the history of your country when I've made the effort to learn from you what the sensitivities, what the history is of your country and your uh, people. Second important fa factor to understand other nations and other countries, other cultures, we need to know a lot more than statistics and historical dates. I was just talking couple of minutes ago with some of you about the financial crisis and I'm working now for OECD. Well, uh, we, uh, at OECD we use a lot of statistics. In fact, we are fond of statistics and figures. 
but to really understand the difference in approach between all kinds of countries, all kinds of countries towards something like a financial crisis, it's sometimes more useful instead of knowing the last detail of the graphics and statistics of a single country or, or a group of countries, it's sometimes more useful to understand how starting from their tradition, starting from their religion, they are talking about things like uh, interest rates, for instance, which sounds very easy to understand uh, for uh, Western uh, Anglo-Saxon oriented economies, people living in these countries, which is totally different uh, compared to the approach of more Islam-led countries, for instance, where a concept like interest rate is, is at stake. It is, uh, can be a, a matter of uh, discussion. So I think that means that, in fact, there is no uh, real good international relationship and no good and effective diplomacy without culture and without knowledge of the culture of other countries. I think indeed that only if we really understand the background of representatives of other cultures, we will be able to decipher what I would call their codes and signals correctly. And that is of course of vital importance because history learns us that uh, war or peace may depend of this kind of understanding. Of course, we are meeting each other here in 2011, the end of the year 2011. And today we witness the rise of English at what I would call a kind of lingua franca. And we see that there is a, a kind of uh, um, common lifestyle, especially among younger people. The dress codes are similar, especially of all young people all over the world. And that all gives the misleading impression that the world, in fact, has become a global village. And of course, there is a lot of communication. And a lot of habits are common to all people living in the plan planet. And so we are in a situation where, um, at first sight, the same words carry the same meaning. But I think that exactly the use of a single language just carries the risk that we do not read and hear and feel the substantial differences in other people's thinking and feeling and reacting, that we do not realize that foreigners indeed are different. And they have the right to be different. And yet foreigners are different, and that also applies to Europe, to the countries and nations of what we call the European Union. The top diplomat of the European Union, Robert Cooper, reminds us uh, this very eloqu eloquently in his book, the breaking of nations. He writes, foreigners are different, and I quote, foreigners have been brought up differently. Their thoughts are structured differently by the different language they speak and the different books they read. The habits have been influenced by different schools, different social customs, different national heroes, different churches, mosques, and temples. They may sometimes watch the same TV sitcoms, but the TV news still comes from a different studio and from a different point of view. Their ideas of justice and legitimacy may be different from ours. I quote uh, a part of his very nice book, very good book, The Breaking of Nations. And I think that from his long experience, Mr. Cooper is very right. Very right in warning us that foreigners, and that may mean also European neighbors within the Union, are different, that uh, words and concepts can have a different content according to the country, to the culture, to the language that is used. Another small example. Recently I was attending in Athens, another meeting about the financial and budgetary situation, but another meeting and there was an address by the uh, president of Greece. He was welcomed, in Greek of course, and uh, at the contrary of buying shoes, I did not make remarks, so it was in Greece, but it was in Greek, but there was translation. And, uh, the little welcoming speech was in the translation beginning with the words, and I quote it in French, Monsieur le Président de la Démocratie. So someone was talking to the president of the uh, Hellenic Republic, and the French translation, someone was talking to him in Greek, and the French translation said, Monsieur le Président de la Démocratie. <laughs> and of course, you, you do not have to be a, what I would call a linguistic specialist to realize that in Greek, the same word is used for republic and for democracy. 
And this is more than just a word. This carries a considerable political content, a considerable political and ideological load. Indeed, it suggests that the republic, that republic is synonymous with democracy and vice versa. And so that, for instance, monarchy is uh, the opposite of it. And this is, of course, a suggestion. And in the room, we had Swedes, we had Dutch people, Belgian people, and so on. It's, anyway, it's a suggestion which most Swedes, Norwegians, Danes, Britons, Dutch, and Belgian people, and other citizens of constitutional monarchies will reject. <coughs> in the same sphere, for instance, the word Republican has a uh, different meaning where they use it in, in, uh, in France, in Belgium, in Scotland, or in, uh, in other countries. In France, where they say uh, c'est un vrai républicain, they pay tribute to the fact that the person that is concerned is uh, eminently worthy of respect, that uh, it is someone who in his public life strongly supports and defends the basic principles of, you know them, liberté, égalité, and fraternité. A Belgian or Dutch person will not understand why a Frenchman has to be called Republican, since France is a republic. In Belgium, a Republican is simply someone who is opposed to the monarchy, who is in favor of the republic, and who is opposed to our king. In, uh, in England, Republican may even invoke associations with the IRA, with the Irish Republican Army. It's just one small example how even though integrating Europe we do not necessarily mean, and even more important, not only mean, but feel the same thing by using the same word. And indeed, no one of us, no one of the citizens of European Union is a blank page. Words, expressions are seldom neutral. They carry a cultural, uh, a cultural uh, payload, a sediment of centuries of collective thinking and acting and being of nations or communities. For instance, after the massacre of the First World War, uh, for instance in my region, well, after the First World War, French and German intellectuals called for reconciliation between both countries, between France and Germany, and for European unification. Already then, they called for European uh, unification. And French and German intellectuals both criticized the political leaders who were blinded by passion and brought a catastrophe over the European continent. But also in that case, notice the difference of the words they used. You take two uh, very important philosophers of that period, Henri Berson and uh, Thomas Mann. Henri Berson called for the struggle of la civilisation contre barbarisme, civilization against barbarism. Thomas Mann, from his side, called for the struggle of culture against civilisation. So it's... Uh, Apart from the first letter, it's exactly the same word. Um, it's even spelled the same way by the French and the Germans, but apparently in the, uh, it means liberation for the former and it means alienation for the latter. The, the concept of civilisation and civilisation. Another instance, our European languages are full of references to bread. We pray to receive our daily bread. Unser Tegut is Brot. Notre pain quotidien. And we earn our bread. We cast our bread upon the waters. We put someone on bread and water, etc., etc. And about a dull, a dull and tedious uh, event, the French even say, c'est long comme un jour sans pain. It's a very long day without, it's like a very long day without bread. All this is more than a long essay about the historical importance of grain and bread in Europe. But for a Chinese citizen, um, and this is a very important country in the world. It's uh, the number one country in the world. These references, cultural references to bread and these sayings simply are uh, near, nearly ununderstandable. So I repeat, there is no good diplomacy without culture, and that means without a real profound knowledge of and understanding of other languages, other ways of thinking. If we project our way, our personal way of thinking, on all our interlocutors, we are bound to misunderstand them. And misunderstanding, misunderstand the other part of the table is uh, an error that rational, pragmatic, democratic Western leaders are prone to make. 
we in the West, as leaders, we often assume that everyone wants the same thing we do, looks more or less in the same way at the world, and that therefore dialogue must necessarily lead to understanding and compromise. Too often, democratic Western political leaders have trouble believing that ideologues, <coughs> ideologues, be they nationalists, be they communist, fascist, religious fundamentalists, well, that these kinds of ideologues do really mean what they say and write. We have problems to understand that. Too often, we, democratic leaders, we have the tendency to brush aside extreme declarations as being emotional or pure rhetorics, or as opening gambits, which will be toned down afterwards. The result often was, and maybe is, that those democratic leaders are not prepared for the consequences of those misunderstandings, consequences which even may mean war. For instance, during the Second World War, a historical uh, figure like uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt thought, contrary to Winston Churchill, that Stalin negotiated more or less in good faith about the shape of Europe after the war. <coughs> but whoever had uh, realistically looked at who and what Stalin was, would know that he would never keep his word about democratic elections in the part of Europe which was occupied by Soviet troops, even Berlin. And before that war, the leaders of France and Germany thought they could make Adolf Hitler, Hitler see reason by dialogue and more dialogue and more dialogue. Well, if they had taken the trouble to read Mein Kampf in the 20s and take it seriously, they might have realized that timely deterrence Timely deterrence would have had more effect than appeals on Mr. Hitler for reason and moderation. And the real short circuit was demonstrated clearly when Hitler attacked Poland, in spite of the 38 agreement which gave him Czechoslovakia, an agreement also that said that an attack on Poland would mean war. And when Hitler nevertheless invaded Poland in 1940, the British Prime Minister, then serving Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, was astonished that Hitler broke his word. And when Great Britain declared war to Germany, war on Germany because of Poland, Hitler from his side was amazed that Chamberlain did keep his word. Ladies and gentlemen, today we see the same reluctance to believe, for instance, that the Iranian president, Mr. Ahmadinejad, means what he says when he declares that Israel should be wiped from the face of the earth. So I think good diplomacy should not only be about continuing the dialogue with Iran on nuclear power, a dialogue which has not had much success until now. Good diplomacy also requires preparing for the day when, for instance, Iran might acquire a weapon with which to bring about destruction. Ladies and gentlemen, to really understand the country or nation, how a country or nation sees itself, what its hardcore is, we need, as I said, to know the language and literature and history of that country, more than we need the figures and the statistics of the OECD, for instance. Indeed, a major erroneous assumption, for instance, is that a foreign policy of a country is only or mainly driven by tangible, concrete, would say rationally explainable interests. I think if that was true, there would hardly ever be war, for war is a very irrational activity. For instance, the, the former Iraqi leader, dictator Saddam Hussein, he did not really pursue a rational, quantifiable interest when for so many years he refused to give UN inspectors the access they required, they required to his nuclear facilities. If he had followed the so-called sunshine policy, and if by doing so he had proven that his country had no weapons for mass destruction, he could have spared his population first the sanctions and then the war. But that was not his interest. His interest was not practical or material and certainly not humanitarian. He just wanted to be an Arab hero, an Arab hero who, and I quote, stood up against America. The fate of his people did not concern Another example, the stubborn British resistance against the Nazi regime when the rest of Europe had capitulated or was collaborating or sought refuge in neutrality. Well, this British resistance 
was uh, not only inspired by hard material interests, this resistance also sprang from the self-assurance of a country that for almost nine centuries, in fact since 1066, had not had foreign invaders on its soil. It sprang from the pride, the pride with which his country, which still had its empire, looked and looks also today at itself. This pride wells up out of so much of its literature and art with which generations were brought up, as in this verse from Shakespeare's Richard III, and I quote, it's about Britain, this royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden demi paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself, against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of man, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, this blood, blood, this earth, this realm, this England. History also explains why the British look differently at European integration than the continental Europeans. And just so, the uh, history of the last century explained why Germany's view on the crisis of the Eurozone, for instance, and its solution has a different slant than that of France. For another example, in the brilliant book by Henry Kissinger on China, he explains out of his uh, very past experience how the, the memory of the uh, very important humiliations imposed on China during the 19th century made that country allergic to anything which smacks of interference in its internal affairs. And that is why, Kissinger writes, any diplomacy towards China which is based on human rights is doomed to failure. Kissinger describes the uh, total clash of opinion after the Tiananmen events in 1989. He says Chinese leaders really could not understand, really could not understand why America took sanctions against China over something which was purely internal and in no way touched any American tangible interest. America, on the other hand, could not but react strongly to an act of brutal repression of a peaceful movement because that act violated essential American, not interests, but values and beliefs. Of course, no diplomacy can change this clash of values and outlook. But by understanding, understanding the historical and cultural background of that clash, careful diplomacy managed to keep the relations between the two countries on track in spite of the quarrel over Tiananmen. So my third point, and I come to conclusion, my third point is that the main instrument of cultural diplomacy is education, massive education, is teaching languages, history, cultural history, to start close at home. Now that we see, for instance, the importance, and we have, uh, we have, we have had someone from the French Embassy, as I understand, about that, but now that we see the importance within the European Union of closer cooperation <coughs> between Germany and France on the crisis in the Eurozone, it is totally illogical, even alarming, that ever fewer youngsters in both countries, both countries in France and in Germany, that uh, ever fewer youngsters learn each other's language. Many years ago, 11 years ago, on the 10th of March of 2000, the so-called Directeur de Recherche of the French CNRS, Centre National de Recherche Scientifique, already rang the alarm in the newspaper Le Monde under the headline, Des Germanistes Evites. He wrote then, in 2000, that France was at risk in the years to come not to be able to correctly understand and interpret developments in Germany and the German-speaking part of Europe. The reason was, he wrote, that there are not enough Germanic philologists in France. And he also regretted the lack of French citizens who had learned German at school, who, I quote, have memories of the Tischreden of Luther, of poems of Heine and Hildemann, who have learned to distinguish between the Rhineland Catholicism and the rural tradition of Pommern, end of quote. Of course, it is impossible in an open global economy, in an open global world, to learn all languages. But it is, I think, indeed necessary that a sufficient number of citizens, a sufficient number of leaders know the languages, know the history, the culture of other countries. For that knowledge is really indispensable in diplomacy because it simply allows us to understand each other, not as individuals, not as people that just need each other, but as nations, as countries. Finally, 
And there I would like to congratulate, congratulate the people that organized uh, this, uh, this event. Finally, as part of that cultural diplomacy and the efforts we have to pay to improve it, it is just very important that we send students abroad for weeks, for months, preferable for years, so that at least they really become impregnated with other culture, with other ways of thinking in other countries from China to Peru. Whether they then return or stay abroad, they will be an important diplomatic capital because they will contribute to closer links and mutual understanding between their country of birth and their country of residence. So to sum up and to conclude, and also thanking you for your attention, diplomacy really needs the knowledge of the cultures, the non-rational elements, the non-natural <coughs> elements, these crucial decision-making characteristics of nations, and there is no good and efficient diplomacy without this cultural knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Latern, for a very thought-provoking and inspiring lecture. I would like to reserve the, the rest of the time now for some questions and comments. I see the first one is already in the back. I think you were very fast to raise your hand. And then we'll come from the back to the front. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Ariane. I'm a bit shy, so excuse me. Um, when I was hearing about indigenous cultures, you're quite right. Indigenous cultures that do not open up do become stagnant. China is a good example, but the Chinese also thought they were the center of the earth, and this influenced them in becoming isolated. Genital mutilation is also a good example, but these are very negative examples. We have them in the West as well, materialism or even pornography that we can do bad all over the world. We can even learn from indigenous cultures, like environmental sustainability. They even treat animals better than we do in the West. They don't treat them like a commodity or a piece of meat. Also, some aspects of most indigenous cultures are more human than, than, uh, than, to them than to us. And stagnant is something that can be argued. Some say the West is becoming morally stagnant, and empathy is a problem. <coughs> Um, also, comparing indigenous cultures is like saying all developed states are the same thing. And so in light of this, I really saw, see no relation between the Mao Chu dynasty and indigenous cultures. And my second part of that is about values and beliefs, about American intervention in China. Um, what about Guatemala, Allende, Mobutu, and Zaire, who parted in Indonesia, and Shah Pavlavi, who used to box, who killed his own people? Like, we have to understand, if we want to understand cultures, we have to understand why I Iran is the way it is today. <laughs> well, a uh, few elements of answer, of course, it's uh, part of your intervention is also a statement, which I respect. Um, I think as far as the first element is concerned about stagnation of cultures and the fact that stagnation is not only, let's say, the monopoly of, uh, would be the monopoly of indigenous cultures, I think the key factor is openness, is self-consciousness balanced by openness. The point is that when a culture um, is locked on itself, uh, doesn't want to interfere with, uh, with other cultures, has not the courage to and the, the uh, assertiveness to be open to other influence, influences, then it is in danger. And so it's, uh, it's, it has to be balanced with this openness. Um, second, uh, your second <coughs> statement, I think we are really, and you, are, you will live in a, in a period that is uh, very interesting, uh, of course, from all kinds of, uh, from all, all points of view, but also from the point of view of um, in storing uh, on a global level a kind of uh, fundamental, um, let's say, uh, a justice. Uh, the, the fact that Mr. Gbagbo, that people from the Balkan are now um, in front of the International Court of Justice, that there is a, a criminal court judging people that um, act against human dignity, against fundamental rights, is a very positive uh, element of the recent evolution. Of course, we have other examples. What happened uh, with Saddam Hussein, what happened with Gaddafi. Uh, <coughs> this is very understandable. It's very understandable, but it would have been preferable, I think, if these people would have been brought before the uh, Court of Justice in, in, in The Hague. So um, it is a very positive evolution that uh, um, step by step, 
we are installing now a kind of uh, global criminal uh, court and that uh, people know that when they are acting against the fundamental rights, the fundamental dignity of their own population, that then they can be, what do you call them in English, trialed? Uh, trialed, yeah. Thank you very much. There is a question in the front. Ooh, lots of questions now. Um, why don't we collect maybe a few together and then you offer a response? Is that okay? You're the boss. Just to allow as many well voices tonight, as possible. Boss. Okay. So, hello. Thank you very much for the work. My name is Alexander Sergashov, and so I have one mm, not very deep question, nevertheless. You talked about diplomacy, this uh, kind of definition with solving problems. And uh, or or living uh, or living with, with them in a soft way, and the cultural diplomacy, uh, the diplomacy between two or more cultures, isn't it? So you also told that uh, you gave this example that there were two people, uh, not two people, ten French guys, ten French people, who have the nice dinner. They told uh, you told that there is no an example of diplomacy, and this is not an example of cultural diplomacy. However, in cultures, one culture, mm, it is possible to see uh, the difference between social cultures uh, and the different cultures between one culture. And this is not necessarily connected with the governments, nationals, and uh, societies, different societies. So my question is, should we understand the culture as uh, their international definition, or is it possible to, to have some room to think about it in a more deeply way? Thank you very much. I'm really moved by many words of you, and I would like to underline the word of education.